Welcome to Canonical, a conversation about books. I'm James Xiao, and I'm joined by Sam Spieler and Yad Deris. Now, before we begin, we had some audio issues recording this part of the podcast. So this is a re-recording. You'll notice that the sound is a little bit different from the rest of the podcast. Sorry about that. But with that said, let's begin. Uh, we are discussing Convenience Store Woman by Sayaka Murata. Now, this was Sam's choice, and it's the first book in our mini-series on Japanese fiction. Sam, can you start us off by telling the listener why you chose this book? Sure. Uh, a friend recommended the book to me originally, and I kept seeing the title pop up everywhere. The premise sounded quirky, but also it sounded like there was something beyond the quirk worth discussing. What what was quirky about the premise? Like, what is the premise? Well, the premise is a convenience store worker, Keiko, Keiko Furukura, who is 36 year, years old and has worked in the same convenience store position for 18 years. Uh, it was inspired by the author's own experience of working in a convenience store for the same length of time why her position working for 18 years in the same convenience store position, why this seems strange to her family and her peers or why any of her actions, uh, which at times verge on the sociopathic pathic, are strange to them as well. Uh, she's constantly confused by human interactions in society. But her job at the convenience store is the one thing she understands and truly enjoys uh, because it's governed by clear rules and function. It's a story about belonging, about one's place in society, and about what purpose means in a larger and sometimes smaller sense. Uh, a little background on the book. This was published in 2016 by Bungei Chunju. And it's the first of her 10 novels to be translated into English. That year, 2016, it won one of the most prestigious literary awards in Japan, the Akutagawa Prize, which is given to the best published literary story by a rising author. And it sold 600,000 copies in Japan alone. I think something I'd like to add is, you know, the general plot of the book, which is, once again, the spoilers um she uh meets uh a guy of similar age right yeah Shiraha. Shiraha. Mm -hmm. yeah um at the store and they eventually well he moves in with her to um because he's homeless and has debts um and they kind of become each other's beards to um cover up for their uh, social deficiencies I guess maybe is a polite way of putting it <laughs> um and in the end he ends up rejecting this kind of arrangement is there anything else you guys want to add the plot i think that's the gist of it i think that there's not a lot to the plot. I think that it's really much more about the subtleties of what happened to her rather than what actually happened. And the the book does have um, side characters, which there aren't a lot of them, but they include like members of her family with members of his family as well. Um, but, okay, so let's uh, start with some initial impressions. Uh, Iyad, do you want to go first? Do you want to tell us what struck you the most? I really was stuff? interested in this book when Sam proposed that we read it because I'm a big fan of convenience stores, and specifically Japanese convenience stores, and I also am interested in Japanese fiction in general. Uh, I have to say, in general, I was a bit underwhelmed by the book. It wasn't as compelling as I had hoped. It's a very short novel, probably not even a novel, more of a novella. And it doesn't really 
live up to its promise. It has a lot of going for it. It has kind of a novel premise and an interesting kind of situation, but it doesn't really live up to its potential. I, I enjoyed the book. Um, it felt like it took a while to get going for me. Uh, the beginning felt a little weaker than the rest of the book, but the longer it went on, the more interested I was in Keiko and where she was going. And I, I kind of could see that I could predict what was going to happen. Um, but I wasn't disappointed by that. I thought that was a natural conclusion. Um, her epiphany, in fact, toward the middle of the book, there was a section where I thought, huh, she seems like she's pretty happy already. So where can this possibly go? And it was kind of like a, a hero's journey, sort of, where there's a fall right before the hero is able to pick herself up and succeed at the end. Um, but I also liked that, at least for me, I could read this book in a couple different ways. There's the literal sense where the story is just about a strange woman who has worked at the same job for 18 years, uh, a job that other people look down on. But to me, the more important and more interesting reading was just someone finding her calling and deciding that it didn't matter what society or what her friends or family thought, but it only mattered what she thought about her life, about her role. I'm generally in agreement with both of you. I think I enjoyed it a little bit less than you, Sam, mm. um, mainly because I agree with Yed in that I felt the beginning. Um, I don't really like the the beginning where they talked about her childhood. I, I I'm conflicted about whether whether or not it's um, necessary. Um, but what I really did enjoy was when they focused in on the convenience store and uh, Murata goes in detail about daily workings of the convenience store. At this time, you're supposed to do this. You have to put advertisements up to do this for this and um, say this when you come in. All of that I really enjoyed. It feels really authentic. Um, even though it's a translator, they're not around Japanese in stores uh, just for me really anchors me in that world and for me that's the strongest part the weakest part when she gives us a little bit backstory do you guys have anything else you want to add about what you enjoyed maybe or what you took issue with like i said i didn't like the beginning as much but i felt that it was necessary to the rest of the story i think seeing her as a strange child uh, really helps me understand her as a strange adult. If we're just plopped into her adulthood and told rather than shown, even if I don't know that the things we're shown are great, I think overall it does benefit the, the storytelling. I, I tend to agree with Sam. I think that we do need to have some sense of how she became this type of person. But I also agree with you, James, in that this part of the novel where they talk about her childhood, it wasn't done well, not that it should have been removed, but rather that it wasn't done enough. There wasn't, for me, enough of a backstory to really believe in her as a character. Yeah, it's in that strange middle ground where you, you want more and I want less, but I think it's because <laughs> what's, there, what's there is not satisfying. Um, specifically, you know, the parts where she comes off as being um, maybe like a sociopath. Um, mm -hmm. It just is not really present in other parts of the novel, so it feels dropped in. Like, specifically at the beginning, where she hits a kid over the head with a shovel because the teacher wants him to be quiet. Is that right? Like, yeah, I have I have more to say on that part later on. That was something that really stood out to me. I guess now is as good of time as any to take a break.
So one of the biggest problems that I had with the novel is the protagonist, Keiko herself, and how how much we can believe that she is a real person. Because fundamentally, I see this as a a realist novel, and I just don't buy her as a character. Uh, do you think that when you're reading this novel, you can believe that a person like her exists within our own world, or even just within the circumstances described in the novel? For me, inside of the novel, Murata's characterization of her as a child feels like it conflicts with the way she is characterized as an adult. This is the scene that you mentioned earlier. On page 9 of my copy of the novel, as a child, she breaks up a playground fight by hitting the other children with a shovel, which is very violent and antisocial behavior. And later on in her life, when she's an adult and working in the convenience store, she seems to be almost the complete opposite of that person. She's very pro-social and very friendly. It's a very contrived and mechanistic sort of social behavior, but it's still very much opposed to the behavior that we saw from her as a child. I think we need more of her backstory rather than less of her backstory, because it seems like her psychological journey from this aggressive and violent child into this very friendly and docile convenience store worker is missing. So much of that journey is missing that she doesn't really cohere into one coherent character. Uh, I think in terms of the real world that we live in, she's also unbelievable. Now, I've known people in my term working in the retail world who are kind of like her, that they're also very devoted to their jobs, but you'd always sense that maybe they wish they had more in their life, or people who don't really have a lot of friends or don't have any romantic partners or anything like that. You still have the sense that they want those things, even if they don't have them. So Murata's character doesn't feel real because I've never really experienced a person who wants nothing more for work. To me, this seems like a big problem with the novel because the themes of alienation and conformity that are present in the novel open up a lot of room for social critique. And I feel like that social critique can only be really meaningful and interesting to the reader if the critique is based somehow or connected somehow to the world that we live in. I'm only interested in social criticism if it can extend to the world that we live in. But if the characters are incoherent, either in their world of the novel or in terms of our world, then the social criticism loses the sense of veracity. It just feels made up, and I end up losing interest in it. To me, she is not fully believable, but that also misses the point for me. Uh, I, I have two questions for you, sort of. Um, one is, do you think part of the disconnect you have is due to it existing specifically in Japanese culture, in Japanese society, that... Maybe it's the novel's mm -hmm. world, but it really isn't your world simply because you're on the other side of it. Well, in, in terms of that first question, that is always a possibility when you're reading books from another culture, especially one that's very different. But in terms of working in retail, while I've never been in Japanese retail, I have been in retail. I did my, my time, and sure. I feel like it's just so inhuman for me to imagine somebody enjoying that work to the extent that Keiko enjoys it. Now, you don't have to be American or German or whoever to dislike that kind of work, and you don't have to, to hate that work as much as I did or other people might have, but I think her enthusiasm is kind of unwarranted, and I would just need more more reason to believe that a person could be so enthusiastic about this. I think that goes then to my second question for you about this, about your point. Um, I, I think I see it as a lot less literal than you and than maybe also you, James. Uh, I see this as an allegory or at least satire maybe, but for me, I, I it's not, 
it's not a stretch for me to see past the literal and try to understand her and her surroundings as symbols or as symbolic, uh, especially given the fact that she is just a convenience store woman, as other people have pointed out to her. Um, I think that's a big part of the point. My question is, I have not read a lot of books about alienation. Um, I haven't read The Stranger, but I think you have, Sam. Is that right? Yes, I have. Okay. Like, I wonder how this book um, pairs, not in terms of quality, but in terms of this kind of issue that you're talking about, Yad, how it compares to something like um, The Stranger or um, Bartleby Scrivener. You know, these books where um, characters are odd, characters mm. are alienated, like other stories of alienation. Do, do you feel like it's similar in that way, where you don't really believe them as a real character, but there, it serves a greater purpose? I I don't know. I, I see where you're going with that. Um, I don't remember enough of Bartleby, the, the Scrivener, to comment, but um, what I do remember about Camus the stranger uh, is yeah that he's not not really a believable character but it was I don't remember what the the overall moral if you could call it that of the story was only that this intense not even hatred this this intense apathy if that makes sense in a character can boil down to uh, the sun being in a person's eyes and deciding to shoot another person. But without remembering what the symbolism was there, I remember that it had to be symbolic, that it had to be something layered and deeper than just the the plot. Because again, like he had been saying, this is not a realistic character. Well, that's my question, because I, I don't think it's realistic, like like what you're saying yet but i'm wondering if it's because it's it's kind of echoing these other novels of alienation i think that to compare it to the stranger is a difficult comparison to make only because we read the stranger so many years after its publication with the background and the context of camus theories of existentialism and I think that when we have that type of understanding, it reinforces our reading in certain ways. And with Murata, I don't know anything about her or her worldview apart from this novel. And I think that if I knew more about her worldview, it would really change the way I saw Keiko. I could see that. Um, you mentioned earlier... Uh, that one of the one of the disconnects for you was that we we have this violent child uh, when she's young breaking up fights with a shovel, and then later we have a very polite and rule oriented person uh, who is quite good at her job and not violent at all, and I I think the that points to part of why this isn't literal to me, but also that kind of an explanation of why she succeeds, why she excels in her job in the convenience store, that she's governed by these rules, that I'm sure there are some people out there that are governed this closely the way she is. Um, but for me, I think that was just Murata's way of highlighting how special the convenience store is, both the experience in general to her and to Keiko. I wonder, you know, going back on like this idea of going back to this idea of alienation, you know, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sure you know more than me about this because it's more in your um, field of study. This idea of, like, is it anomi? Anomi? where um, it's a situation, I, I'm just going off of the definition here. Uh, such, yeah, it's a situation where the social norms have broken down. And so it's like a person's inability to identify with the values of society or um, 
what the, what what is perceived to be the values of society, which seems to apply here, uh, which is like she cannot identify with like societal values. Like she, it doesn't even register. It's like she she has to kind of study it, right? Um, does it? I mean, is is that how you might see this? I do see her as a character who understands the world only through great effort. She doesn't come to understanding easily in the way that a more typical person would. But what I struggle with is that, well, as a child, it's understandable she would make some mistakes. That her interest in understanding more of human life stops at the point when she reaches the convenience store. So, well, of course she has matured. Why does she stop her maturation when she reaches the point where she gets the job in the convenience store? Why doesn't she continue to study society and to figure out dating and to figure out friendship and family relationships as much as she is willing to figure out how to sell fried chicken and rice balls? I think she she's just not interested in things. We do see her studying people's speech patterns. We do see her adjusting her own speech mm-hmm. and and regarding the way other people talk to each other and how they affect each other, as well as the way other people affect her own clothing. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I agree, but... I guess my question here would be, why is she interested in that and nothing more? I would, if this novel continued, if the story continues past its where it stops currently, I, I would think that we would see a character who doesn't dress as much like she's trying to fit in anymore and would just dress how she wants to. The, the reason I say that is, I think she's only doing that in order to fit in. She wants to be a a part of society uh, as far as someone who isn't going to be bothered by the other people in society for not fitting in. So Mm -hmm. I think her, her whole reason for matching people's vocal patterns and matching their clothing styles really only serves her as far as wanting to fit in so once she's hit an epiphany late in the book i don't think that is going to be an issue for her anymore okay um i i think if you do look at it as you know it's a story of like anime where she's trying to um she's kind of creating her own system of social norms in a way she learned but she kind of picks it up like from what other people gives her. So so she kind of picks up social norms from other people, but not in the way that we naturally learn it. It kind of has to be told to her and she has to mimic it. Like it's not kind of a more natural learning. I could conceivably understand why at the beginning when she's younger, she learns, okay, like I can't hit someone on the head with a shovel and that she doesn't have to learn it again when she's older. Um, When she's older, she's learning like, maybe more subtle um, methods of being a normal person. I mean, I can kind of see it, but I I don't think it's uh, explicitly spelled out for us to the point where I can confidently say this is what's going on. But I I can see it as as like a, I can see it as like if the writer had set out, if Murata thought, okay, I want to create this character who does not understand social norm. And I want to show how at the beginning she, you know, has these kinds of thoughts, but, and then she has to learn through these experiences. And then when she becomes a social, uh, um, a convenience store woman, she is learning these kinds of things. Um, I, I mean, I could, you know, but it's, it's a stretch because it's not really, presented. I think we, like, this is something that I have to bring to the book. I don't think it's presented to us from the I think you're right. I think what would make the novel stronger, from my point of view, if there was a scene when she first started working in the convenience store and she had an earlier epiphany where she said, oh, well, now I can stop kind of 
studying social behavior because I've found the world that I I want to fit into. That to me is what makes her difficult to believe is because we don't really see the scene where she falls in love with the convenience store and we don't really see her reason for stopping her study of social behavior. We don't see it like a clear dividing line, but we do see her love of it through her actions and through her descriptions. Yeah, I I think what I mean, though, is I want to see her not just loving it, but falling in love with it. Doesn't she sort of do that when the first time, I think when she's 17 or 18, when she first sees the place where she eventually starts working, uh, she talks about how neat and orderly it is and how clean and how bright. I, I, I saw that as the moment where she falls in love. I think that you're right, that there is a, a scene where she does encounter the convenience store and she's attracted to it. But I suppose what I'm saying is, is that it should be, it should be amplified more because hmm. she's not just a fan of convenience stores in the same way that I'm a con- fan of convenience stores, but she's like a real diehard, you know? Basically, the way I see the novel is Murata has created this extraordinary character. And anytime something is extraordinary, if that extraordinariness is central to the premise of the novel and central to making the novel work, I need it to be more fleshed out. Otherwise, it just feels, I don't know if cheating is the right word for it, but it feels unfair to the reader. I feel like the reader maybe deserves some sort of uh, an explanation or some sort of way of making this unusual circumstance credible. Hmm. Um, I have, I'd like to talk about the second part of your um, question, which is the idea of social critique. Um, I wonder, you know, I, like I said earlier, I really loved how the convenience store was described here. But do you think it's that important? Like, what if it wasn't a convenience store? What if it was a gas station? Or what if it was uh, some generic office? Like, does it have to be a convenience store for any part of the story to work? I think yes and no. I think it can't, it can't be an office job because there are, there's ways to move up there. I think the reason why it's a convenience store, and, and I could see it being a uh, a gas station, but that, I think, only works in our society. I think the reason why it's important that it's a convenience store, um, not only is it Murata writing about her own experiences. I think that convenience stores are special, but I don't think that they are so special that it would make the novel impossible if it were a gas station. I think structurally what's important about it is that it needs to be a dead-end service job. As long mm-hmm. as it fits those two criteria, I think it would work no matter what kind of job it was. Here's a reason why it does probably have to be a convenience store, though. Uh, specifically one of these, the Colombinis, is that it's kind of a microcosm for Japan. Uh, It's a place that everyone uses. Uh, It's a place where you can find maybe not everything under the sun, but you can find all of your basics. You can, you know, pay your bills. You can Mm -hmm. buy clothes. So it's a really tiny little world. Where as a, a gas station just sells gas, or our Western Western convenience stores, really it's just for snacks and lottery tickets. Yeah, I, I think you're right that convenience stores represent kind of the pinnacle of what Murata was probably trying to go for, and that there is a lot to mine, a lot of interesting content within how they fit into Japanese society. But, well, a gas station or a cafe or something 
wouldn't work as well. I don't think that they are different in kind to the point that it would be impossible. I think that this novel could work just as well if it were called Barista Woman or something else. <laughs> this is what kind of, um, because to your point, you had about, you know, your question about if the, if this is social criticism or is this a critique of society, I think this is the weak point because we definitely can understand and see the convenience store, but I don't think the critique is so clearly uh, verbalized or presented where mm -hmm. I think that if it is, if the critique was clearly presented, then you will, you would totally understand why it's a convenience store. You will understand like what the convenience store stands for, not just like a, a generic dead end job, which is kind of where I land as well. I feel like you could have put in any kind of generic dead end job instead of convenience store. Um, with the caveat that because none of us are Japanese um, and none of us can read Japanese and we're not really living in Japan, that maybe there's some kind of connotation or meaning attached to a convenience store that we're just not privy to. Like if maybe that's a, an issue here where if we were Japanese, then we would understand all the attendant meanings that come with it. That's, that's possible. Um... I, I don't have as much of an issue with it as you guys. Um, I'm happy to accept the basic premise. Um, it, there, there certainly are things that aren't believable, but I took that in stride. I think a little more. Certainly past the the once you hit maybe the first third uh, and get that underway. I, 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 it's not that I found her believable, but I was much more willing to go along with the, the setting as the convenience store with the character, um, as unbelievable as she may, may be. And, uh, yeah, I didn't have a problem looking into the social commentary. I, uh, I know we'll, we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit later. You know, I, I, I mean, this does kind of transition well to what I want to talk about. Um, but I, I actually, I don't have a problem with her being believable or not believable. That is not a central question I have, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, my central question really has to do with how we understand the story on a thematic level, um, which is kind of, yeah, second point. You know? Like, I actually, I'm, I'm with you, Sam, in that I, I don't know if she's unbelievable, but I also don't really care if she is. Um, because I've read stories where characters are not very believable and I can kind of go along with it. Uh, it doesn't bother me. Um, sure. But what does bother me is the ending. Um, I have a really hard time with the ending because I'm not really sure how to understand it. Um, so just to give a, a summary for our listeners, um, you know, this, I view this, this as a story of alienation where we have Keiko our first alienated character, our main alienated character, and she meets another alienated character, Shiraha. Can we agree that he's also like someone who's alienated from society and not just like a misanthrope, like a generic misanthrope, but like it's to the point where he's alienated? Do, do you guys agree with me on that point? Oh, definitely. I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I don't know, because I feel like he's a bit flat, so I, I think other people might have different interpretations. But So the two of them... Um, agree to get married to mitigate the social cost from being outcast because they're both alienated from society. But uh, so as part of that, Shraha arranges for Keiko to interview for what he considers to be a real job, a non-dead-end job, as we were talking about earlier. But she has an epiphany where she realizes that she belongs to the store. And so this is pretty much from the last page. I'm going to quote. She says, think of me as an animal, a convenience store animal. I can't betray my instinct. And then later on, on the same page, she says, the animal me, the convenience store worker, has absolutely no use for you whatsoever. Um, so she says this to Shiraha. And the Shiraha is, you know, surprised, angry. He says she's not human. And Keiko thinks, well, that's what I'm trying to tell you. 
Uh, and then the novel ends with her, you know, having her epiphany. She, uh, well, I mean, this is post epiphany, but she thinks like her hand and her feet exist only for the store. And then she sees her own reflection and she thinks back to her nephew being born. So it's kind of like a metaphorical birth or rebirth here. Um, but the reason why I think it's problematic, and I don't know if you guys agree, is that I feel like we're given two ways of reading the ending. Um, the use of animal, the word animal, and how, you know, the, the fact that her limbs belong to the store, you know, I kind of see that as being um, absurd or grotesque, but it contrasts with um, the imagery of her rebirth, um, which seems very positive. Um, and then if you think about that in context of like um, being reborn as opposed to being tied down in a marriage to Sharaha, who, you know, is quite rude to her, um, says he would never ever think of penetrating her and kind of demeans her at every opportunity. Um, you know, this seems like a positive ending, that it's kind of an escape from a marriage that we would consider to be a bad thing. So, but my issue here is I don't know how to read the ending. Like, I don't know if this is an ending where we should be happy for Keiko, or if this is kind of a tragic ending where the novel kind of says, well, a person can only be self-actualized in this case if she gives her herself over to her work. Um, I don't know if you guys had the same issue here with the ending, or if you read these, this passage differently. I didn't mind the ending. I agree with you that it can be read in different ways, but I actually saw that as one of the novel's strengths rather than as a weakness. It offers you the ability to see social critique on multiple fronts. You have the critique of society in terms of how if you wanted to go this far with it, you could say that global capitalism is making people into automatons and robbing them of their humanity. But I think other readers might have a more individualistic point of view, and they would see it as a celebration of an individual's agency and an individual's power to choose the kind of lifestyle that works best for them in the face of what society is pushing them towards. So I think that both of these two readings can coexist, and I think that that's probably the strongest part of the novel, in my opinion. I'd agree. I, I don't have a problem with the ending. I agree, too, that, yeah, you can definitely read these, the animal and the limbs as being both absurd and grotesque, but also I definitely think we should feel happy for Keiko at the end. Um, I also I don't think of it as a self actualization only through self dissolution in one's work, but more like self actualization through discovery of one's calling and true enjoyment uh, without the need to or w without feeling the need to play to society's wishes, if society can be wholly represented by the people around Keiko. So. And you're reading, Sam, like if you read this as kind of like a very positive ending, um, what is the social critique? It's interesting that you brought up Animal uh, and her use of that. I hadn't really zeroed in on that before, but if we kind of superficially call the difference between animals and humans our society, the way we've structured our society, then maybe that's part of the, her rejection of society. Yes, she's going to be this automaton of a uh, sort, um, and that she's giving herself wholly over to it. But she's also embracing this animal side of her, which is a rejection of society. So she's she's embracing who she is rather than trying to fit into a role that has been given to her. I think how you view the ending depends on how you view the central question of the novel, which to me is, is working as a service worker 
and exclusively and merely working and merely existing as a service worker a reasonable way to live? Is that a reasonable way to spend one's time on earth? And I think if you say that it is reasonable, then her victory over Sharaha's attempt to corral her into normal society is a very positive and celebratory thing. But if you don't think that it's a reasonable way for people to live, then her victory over Sharaha's type of uh, socialization, it's just kind of a, a Pyrrhic victory where she has succeeded in living the lifestyle that she wants, but the lifestyle that she wants is essentially an inhumane and very mechanistic and ultimately unsustainable one. It's unsustainable from our point of view, but I think it's more simple. It's stripped down. She's not looking for, she's not looking to climb the social ladder. She's not looking to, you know, live more comfortably and more easily over time. But I think that's her main point is that if this is enough for her, shouldn't that be enough for everyone else? I think that it's unsustainable not merely in kind of this metaphorical or psychological sense, but unsustainable even in a very literal sense. If we're in, this novel was punished in 2016, right? Mm -hmm. It's like right around the time when self-checkout was becoming a huge thing <laughs> and delivered groceries was becoming a huge thing and all of these drones delivering things, you know, like actually investing yourself in the service industry in 2016 might not be the smartest thing for a person to do. Probably not, but I think, again, that goes to your more literal reading of this, whereas I, I did not see it as that literal. Well, I, I think what I'm getting at is that it has the potential for criticism. Whether or not you want to accept the criticism, I think that you can admit that it's potentially criticizing people who are willing to remove part of their lives for convenience sake. And I think that perhaps it's not just convenience sake in everybody's eyes, but in my eyes, I would see somebody like Keiko refusing to learn more about adult life as just, oh, well, I don't have to do it. I can just work as a convenience store worker forever. And then I don't have to struggle. And for me, I feel like this is an attitude that is worthy of critique because I think it is an attitude that is prevalent in our society and perhaps a malicious attitude or a negative attitude, something that should be avoided. So, yeah, do you view the ending as kind of a tragic ending? I do see it as a tragic ending. And like I mentioned earlier, it's a Pyrrhic victory. So it's good for her in the sense that she's self-actualized, but it's bad for her in the sense that she doesn't realize that the choice that she's making for herself is actually a bad choice. I think the reason why I struggle with the ending is I don't feel like I have enough from the book to say that this is what Murata is saying, that, that she's actually criticizing, criticizing this kind of work because it seems to me like she's glorifying this kind of work and any of the um, attitudes that we have toward being a convenience store worker we have to bring ourselves bring our own experience into the equation you know like mm -hmm. you're relying on your interpretation of what it's like to work as a convenience store worker your own retail experience this this conversation kind of segues nicely into my main concern, my main interest in the book, uh, if we can go that way. Uh, I don't know if the term is used in the original Japanese text, but this d novel deals heavily with the concept of ikigai, which is a reason for being and for waking up in the morning. Um, I've seen ikigai described as a mixture of what you love, what you're good at, what you can be paid for, and what the world needs. But my big question is, what is Murata saying about Ikigai and how it relates to gender if, if this is something that she's saying? Is she saying anything at all about gender? What is her conclusion about these things and their role in society? 
to me, one of the central points of the novel is that Ikigai and all it carries with it should be determined solely by the individual, not by society. So by the middle of the book, Keiko is more concerned about how she fits into and serves society. Like, how can she live up to the standards of her coworkers, her parents or her sister? She, should she find a mate, any mate, like Shiraha, if it'll satisfy those around her? But by the end of the novel, she's had an epiphany. She doesn't care about how society sees her. She's already found the one thing that she truly loves, and she's fantastic at it. And she can get paid for it, enough to live on at least. Uh, and it does aid society in some minor way. Maybe it's not as much as what society would want of her. But I don't think all cells in an organism need to excel at the same level in order for the organism to thrive. In fact, there's some points in the novel where Keiko seems to be the only one who understands that this role, not that of a mother, or wife, or a district manager, but just as a store worker, is her utmost potential. Uh, so to me, I, I feel that Murata also is saying that gender should not factor into this concept as much as it does in Japanese society. Uh, what do you guys think? I, I have more to say on this, but... I'd kind of like your input before we go on. Uh, for me, I think that what James had said regarding my interpretation could equally be said regarding your interpretation, that this is something that you're bringing to the novel, which is not necessarily in the text itself. I think that Murata does invite some of this gendered talk just because we have the parallels between Shiraha and... Uh, Keiko, but I think that while well, James might see this as a way of critiquing the interpretation or putting some limits on the interpretation, I would have the view of the point of reading a novel is that the novel creates the scene for interpretation and whatever you can bring to the novel becomes valid because that's what the novel is supposed to be. In my way of thinking, the novel is not really limited by what the author meant to put in there, but rather by what the reader can bring to the novel. And what the reader can bring to the novel is limited by the scene that the author creates. So for me, I think that this type of, maybe you could say as a feminist reading, is a very valid one, even though we don't really see Murata really pushing for it in the text itself. Well, I, I'm just going to agree in that I don't think it's um, really present in the novel. I think you can certainly read it um, in that way. But I, I don't see it as being very present. I think um, what's sort of more present is her oddity, and it's not due to her gender necessarily, but just due to her outlook and her inability to conform. I think that is a bigger issue. It's not her inability to conform as a woman, but it's her inability to conform as a human. That's the issue. I agree, um, but I do think there are hints at some sort of feminism. Um, and also that while maybe it's not as big a thing as just how she functions as a human, I do think there is a big split uh, between how she functions as a human and how she functions as a woman, and that those two are important. Maybe not on the same level, but going right from the title, uh, we're, we're given, <laughs> the in English, the title is Convenience Store Woman. Uh, but in the original Japanese, it's convenience store person. Uh, in Japanese, it's konbini ningen. Uh, Keiko furthers this point when she argues with Shiraha, uh, who at this point is a newly hired coworker who is droning on about men and women's roles in society. And she says, Shiraha, we're in the 21st century. Here in the convenience store, we're not men and women. We're all store workers. Yeah, I think that you're right that it does have a place in the novel. I think that, uh, for me, the bigger point 
where it emerges is not just that she sees herself as a worker rather than as a woman, but in that in the center of the novel, when she is willing to have this sham relationship with Shiraha, even though everyone knows that Shiraha is a kind of a loser, everyone is really happy for her. And it's kind of Murata's way of pointing to this attitude that I'm assuming is part of Japanese society, is that being with a partner and having a man of any sort is better than not have a man. And that, to me, I think is the thing that Murata is maybe pushing against because I think for Keiko, having Shiraha in her life is probably not better than having nothing. And I think that for her, if we go back to this idea of ikigai, somebody might say that a person cannot have this kind of reason for being without having a partner, especially for a woman. You cannot have this reason for being without having this partnership husband role fulfilled. But I think that the novel pushes against that. Isn't it the same for him, though? Because Shiraha needs her as much as she needs Shiraha. Like, for me, it's more of a commentary on partnership, that you need to have a partner. It's not so much that you need to have a man, because Shiraha also recognizes that he needs to have a wife to put on appearances. I, I here's, I, I feel, you mentioned that uh, Shiraha is flat for you. And I feel like that is one of the biggest problems I have with the book is that I'm not really sure how to take Shiraha. He, he just seems like a awful, boring, brooding person and isn't really fully fleshed out. Um, so I, it doesn't feel as big a deal to me when she finally throws him away. Um, it's, it just seems a little too natural. You know, even if she's this odd person who, you know, only such an odd person would even agree in the first place to uh, have this m relationship of sorts of convenience with Shiraha. Yeah, it, it doesn't feel as strong a uh, deal for her to reject him at the end. Um, maybe it's because, once again, like I'm not privy to Japanese culture, but um, why does he need to be so offensive? Like, I like it. You know, I like that. I think it's interesting. But I'm wondering, like, what does it actually add to the novel that he's so offensive? Like, he could be a uh, misanthrope in any number of ways, but he's kind of this callback caveman kind of missing um, but then it's revealed to be a kind of like an act and then he's actually just a broke homeless loser it, that's the part like it doesn't really you know like I, I don't know how to grapple with that I think he I mean he's supposed to be a foil for her right so where at least as an adult we have this Keiko who is she doesn't fit into society, but she does her best and, and is, at least in the middle of the book, she's interested in being a perfectly functioning cog. Um, whereas we have this antagonistic view in Shiraha, who does not want to interact with society at all. Um, he wants to withdraw from it completely and tries to drag Keiko down with him originally. So what's his ikigai? His, oh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think he's like developed he just... enough as a character. Yeah. I don't think that we could know that. Well, yeah. that's, I guess that's what it is. It's like, he, he, you know, when he has these, he makes these offensive remarks, you kind of feel like, oh, well, okay, we're, we're, we're kind of, we're going to kind of see kind of person he is and what he wants but in the end all he really wants is to um you know be fed and have someone pay his debts i don't i don't know if this makes for good storytelling but maybe that's part of why she's more fleshed out um 
maybe it would be better if he actually had real personality and more of an argument uh, for <laughs> why anyone should side with him. Uh, yeah, I, I think that makes it easier for the reader, at least, to understand Keiko and to love Keiko and, and her, her v- view. The stakes would be higher if he were a great guy. If he were not such a loser, when Keiko rejects him at the end, it would be even more celebratory because then we could see her as throwing away something valuable. But if she dumps a loser, we'll be like, yeah, of course you should dump him. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's part of what makes it problematic, I guess. Um, because, you know, you look at the, your concept of Ikigai, not your concept, Sam, because you didn't come up but. Um, the you don't know that concept that you that you defined, uh, Samu. Um, like it's a mixture of what you love. He loves nothing. Um, what you're good at, he's good at nothing. Uh, <laughs> what you can be paid for, nothing. And what the world needs, well, certainly is not him, right? So he's mm-hmm. got like none of of a reason. He's got no reason for being. Well, maybe that maybe that makes him the perfect foil then. That that I, why, maybe. yeah. I, Maybe perfect, perfect foil for everybody. Like every single <laughs> yeah. person is his foil. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to take issue with, though, Sam, is earlier you had said that you thought that Murata was showing through Keiko that this concept of Ikigai should always be determined individually, and it shouldn't be determined by society. But Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I can accept that because to me it seems like Ikigai, just in terms of what it is, is an integration of social considerations alongside personal considerations. Because one of the four items or one of the four components is what you love. And that has equal weight alongside what the world needs and what you're proud of and what you can be paid for. So to me, to say it's all an individualistic thing is maybe missing the point of Ikigai? I don't know. What do you think? Well, this is my Western interpretation, um, but it's also my interpretation of the book that you can't have Ikigai without what society needs. But who is asking that question? Is society determining what society needs? Or is Keiko, in this case, determining what society needs? Because in in society's view, at least for in the scope of this book, society doesn't really need convenience store workers. They're expendable. They can be replaced fairly easily. But in Keiko's view, that's not true. In Keiko's view, she serves society in a very specific, very worthwhile way that no one else in the book seems to be able to fulfill. I mean, she even, at the end of the book, she can hear the convenience store as if it's speaking to her. That is something that I don't think anyone else in the book would claim or want to claim or even assume is possible. So I, to me, it depends on who is asking what a person's ikigai is. And I think her determination at the end is that it's not up to society, that society is not the only one who should have a voice uh, or maybe any voice in a person's ikigai, that it's all up to interpretation by the individual. So uh, to conclude, let's talk about the impact of this book. Who do you think is the audience for convenience store women? Uh, I think that this is a book that will resonate much more deeply with the native Japanese reader than with the Western reader. I think that convenience stores and Japanese culture have connections that they don't really have outside of that. So I don't that foreign readers will understand all of the the nuance it won't make as big of an impact. I guess I'd agree. Um, I love the premise, and I think it's got a good message. But as much as I enjoyed it, I, I do wonder if it has or will have a bigger impact in Japan, you know, in the 
future. I also think that even though I got something out of it, I'm not the target audience. I'll say the people that recommended this to me and most of the authors of the lists on which I saw the book were women. Um, so maybe I'm not the best person to judge or even guess where this book will be or should be in 10 years. I didn't get to follow up with some of the people that I talked to about this, but something I found interesting is the, the people, when I've run into people that have read this, there's a, a pretty big uh, spread, like a spectrum rather, uh, where people fall, whether they enjoyed it or whether they found it difficult. Some of the people I've talked to absolutely loved it and read it in one sitting. And other people, even though it's really short, uh, found it a slog. What do you think they found difficult about the book? Because I didn't find it difficult. I found it pretty easy to read. Yeah, I don't know. So that's what I mean by I didn't really get a chance to follow up with those people. They were pretty brief conversations. Did the difficulty kind of divide these people along certain lines, maybe according to their gender or their age or some other thing? So far, they've all been women, so I can't divide that way. Um, I don't know if I could divide them any other way. I just, I don't really know. I think the novel, it, it has a certain appeal to women more than it has to men, just because even though a lot of men who are aware of gender and sex and politics and how they relate to each other know that work and family life are problematic for women, it's not as pressing a concern as it is for women who actually deal with this kind of thing in their lived reality. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it goes to relatability, right? Is that what you're saying yet? But um, if you're female, it, you can relate It's not just relatability. I think it's something that, honestly, men who are quote-unquote woke are paying attention to, but it's not even that a lot of men can't relate. It's that they don't even think about this at all. It's not even part of their worldview. They don't know that these are issues that women face. Would you say that these issues are more universal? Well, I think that there is an aspect to it that men can connect to, but I think that if you limit the novel to just the aspects that men can relate to and men can connect to easily, you're cutting out a lot of the the interest in the novel because I think it is very significant that this happens to a, a female protagonist. I don't think that that's incidental. I agree. I think there's the there's the overall message of uh, how how an individual moves through society and deals with society, but to only focus on that is to cut out a big theme of the book, which is her specific i think a big reason for this may also be attributed to the character uh, to sharaha because he's so offensive um <laughs> yeah it, it i mean it's kind of sets up this kind of um, dichotomy right like where you are actively rooting for her and also because he's so offensive he kind of um I, I don't want to say he poisons the discourse, but he so strongly steers the discourse in one direction. So, like, he pushes the conversation toward masculinity, toxic masculine, or, um, you know, this idea of the role of the woman. You know, like, he brings that, in my mind, he brings it to the story. Yeah. I, I don't think he's the sole person doing that. Yes. Um, but you're right. He's He's definitely the biggest drive of that point and certainly the most negative or at least at least on the surface the most negative um do you think that either one of you do you think that this book will be read um 10 or 20 years from now i think it depends much more on what murata does and much less the quality of this book she seems to be an up-and-coming novelist and it seems like she'll do more important things but I think if we kind of abstract this book from the rest of her, it's pretty lightweight. And I don't think that people will continue reading it unless Murata's career in the future gives people more reason. True. 
this is certainly her biggest work um, by virtue of the fact that we we don't know much about her and and this is the first novel of hers to be translated into English but yeah I, I think you're right that even in Japan even though we have no idea how well received in general she is yeah if she were to stop writing completely it probably wouldn't have as much impact uh, and wouldn't continue to get more readers uh, as if she were to continue writing. What do you think, James? What What's the, the position does... of this novel in, ten, in your eyes? Uh, to the four for discussion, which is probably why it sold so well. I think that it's limited by what I think is a rather incomplete narrative. Um, it's it's a novella that could be a novel because it feels very unsure of itself in some ways that um, it doesn't really go beyond the premise, which is what strikes people. Like the premise is what makes it interesting. So in that regard, I think her other work will definitely be important in sort of keeping this book in the limelight because I think just this book on itself, it, what you said, yeah, it being lightweight, I completely agree. I think there's just not enough here for someone to um, hold on to and kind of proclaim. Like, it's actually not a book that I would necessarily recommend to a lot of people, just because, I mean, unless someone's looking for what I would consider to be a, a light read, um, I won't really recommend this book to other people. Would you? That's interesting. I I think I would, um, but but not to everyone. I would mm -hmm. be judicious in my choice of who who I recommend this to. Um, I could see this being taught at a school. I think. Mm -hmm. I, I think we've I think we've talked about some really interesting things. Not just the premise, but like I said before, I do think it has a good message. Uh, yeah or at the very least an interesting message, one worthy of discussion. I I would not teach this in any creative writing because no. I, I, I think that it's so, um, there are quite a few flaws here that, you know, unless I were to teach a book that I, where, where I would want to point out like um, some very basic concepts like introducing a foil you know, in Sharaha, but then why would I teach this book? I could teach any story that has a foil, you know. Sure. Why would this be limited to creative writing classes rather than just general lit classes or women's studies classes? Oh, I, I, I'm just speaking from my experience. Yeah, I'm just speaking from my experience, like as a creative writer. I, I'm just saying I would not teach this um, I, I in wouldn't a creative either. writing class. No, I, I wouldn't either. I, I was picturing more along the lines of a uh, progressive high school class or a, like he had said, a, a lit class or a women's studies class. Mm -hmm. uh, I could, I could see it fitting well in one of those. Yeah. I think one challenge is the fact that it's Japanese. Um, sure. If it were taught in a Japanese university in like a women's studies class, I, I could totally see that. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think, the fact that it's Japanese makes it difficult to teach. Because it's it's not just foreign, it's very foreign yeah. in, in concept. Um, there's just that extra level of inaccessibility that I think, you know, it, it's not a strong enough work in my mind that to overcome that. Um, that, that sort of uh, barrier of cultural exchange and cultural um, confusion, you know, like, so there are certain parts of the book that you might not just totally understand because you're not Japanese. Uh, I don't have full confidence in the translator either. We didn't really talk about the translation, but that, you know, um, the use of the word custom early on in the book, it just really threw me off. Uh, mm -hmm. It kind of like, yeah, it just, I, I don't have full confidence in the translator. I, and I feel like that's kind of uh, tricky when you I don't, don't have full confidence. Yeah, I don't remember if we talked about this before, but that is 
Um, that is correct. We just don't really use that that phrase in English, but that's not it's a it's an archaic form um, that used to be used apparently in English and still is used in Japan. But it's yeah, it's just not not translating. Yeah. Uh, what I was going to say, just to change gears a little bit here, is with regard to this book's potential for an audience, one danger, I think, is for the type of Western reader who's interested in quote-unquote weird Japan to get attached yeah. to this book, because <laughs> I think that type of person abounds, and that kind of image of weird Japan, it abounds in the cultural imagination of people in the West, in America specifically. And I think that the reader who looks at this novel from that perspective will really miss out on a lot of what the book has to offer. Hmm. Because it's furthering the otherness or? Well, I think that when Westerners look at Japan, I say, oh, Japan is so quirky and weird. They end the conversation prematurely. They don't really respect the culture enough to investigate it to the level that it needs to be investigated. And they also probably will just look at the issues where Chiraha wants to stay at home in Keiko's apartment, and he has these very negative attitudes towards women, and they say, oh, Japanese people are so weird, and oh, Japanese men are crazy. And they won't really understand the nuances like this is weird to Japanese men themselves and this is weird to Japanese women like these aren't just like they're different from us issues but rather issues that are much more complicated yeah though I think you could say that about just about any media coming out of Japan that there will always be the reader or the viewer that stops at the gate and goes that's silly, crazy J Japanese people. But I think that with most of the stuff that's coming out of Japan, yeah, the, you can dismiss it that way, but there's always going to be something below that. There's always going to be something yeah. beyond that. No, you're, you're absolutely right. The reason why I brought it up for this novel in particular is just because it does have that quirky appearance. Like, if you look sure. at the novel... I think one of the blurbs uses that word quirky, and I think that's like everybody's go-to word for this. And right. I think that it's very, it's, it's, in a, it's meant probably to be an appealing word, but it's kind of like a, a curse. Yeah, there's a little bit of denigration there. Um, I, I would say to the strength of the novel, though, I think it invites that at the beginning. And then I think... For me, it, it succeeds, but uh, maybe for you guys, it attempts to turn that over on its head, and by the end, it, it has shifted. Okay, um, let's pause the discussion here. We'll revisit Convenience Store Women after we finish reading the other two books in our Japanese fiction miniseries. The next episode will be about Kafka on the Shore by Haruki Murakami. So till then, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon.